Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. When we first began the, the Sasquatch Genome Project and we ended up uh, publishing our paper, um, we found that the peer reviewers weren't really concerned with our science. They seemed to say that our science was okay. There was no critique to it. Uh, what there was critique of was they just couldn't believe the results and even stated so in some cases. Um, they actually said that it just had to be contamination. And that was the main complaint. And people that haven't read the paper have just picked up and run with this statement. However, we have graphical proof that uh, they're not contaminated. The samples aren't. And I'm making a video to that effect. Um, however, I thought before I released that video, I would uh, let y'all enjoy a little clip out of France. Um, Dr. Tom Gilbert, who's a geneticist at the University of Copenhagen, very famous man. He's published over 125 peer-reviewed papers. He's done a lot of work on ancient human origins and uh, is, is one of the top people in the field. And he actually sequenced some hairs from Sumatra, from the Orang Pendek. And his state-of-the-art famous university laboratory is not going to contaminate the samples. However, in this clip, not only does he say that his results were human for mitochondrial DNA, just like ours were, um, but he also is followed by the hair analyst that says the hair wasn't human, just like what our results were. However, I had to laugh because the um, person that did the hair analysis uh, also accuses Dr. Gilbert of contaminating the samples. This is so ludicrous, I can't even tell you. And so I thought you would enjoy seeing the clip. Don't take my word for it, watch the clip. Um, and in, enjoy the video. Um, and next video I'll try to post will, will be the uh, one where I'm pulling out some of our raw data to show there's no contamination. Um, hope y'all enjoy. Bye for now. What I think initially were, was interesting about the sample was the hair color, right? They, they had these short fragments and they were this sort of orangey color that's at least not common to the native people of, of the area. 24 hours later, it's the moment of truth for the potential Orang Pendek hair. The DNA sequence is now available for analysis. Now it must be compared with the 30,000 sequences of animals that are already classified in the World Gene Bank. And we did our standard DNA analysis. We basically extracted the DNA from the hair. We had a complete identity, 100% match over the region we looked at to human DNA. This led me at the time to the conclusion that it's basically a human. I don't think this hair uh, sample could have come from a human in any way because the structure is all wrong. Human hairs are very characteristic. 
And this one does not look in any way like a human here. The human DNA that Tom Gilbert and the DNA lab found in the sample could have come from humans. It could have been simple contamination when the hairs were sampled. Uh, somebody forgot to put gloves on or just lose that drop of sweat on the hairs. I wouldn't dream of suggesting that this is evidence for the existence of a new species, the orang pendek. But this is a clear indication that there is something. And we are back with somebody that I've been wanting to have on the show for a very long time. And we finally managed to make that happen. So I'm like super excited for it. And uh, actually, I had a, a little thing here that I was going to pull up and let you guys see. But apparently, I don't have it loaded right now. But it was a direct quote from my guest from years and years ago from uh, Morning News on, I believe it was ABC, talking about how the Sasquatch are not big monkeys running around the woods. They're actually a kind of people. And so with that shoddy introduction, let me introduce the amazing Dr. Melva Ketchum. Welcome to World Bigfoot Central. Thank you for having me. The pleasure is all mine. I've been a fan for years, as I told you, and I know you don't like the word fan, but uh, I'm in this to, to do the actual research. I do the field research. I got a bunch of friends that do the same thing. We try and gather the evidence, and we need people on the academic side of things to sift through that evidence and try and make some sense out of it, which is why I think you know every single actual person involved in the legitimate Bigfoot community um, owes you a huge debt of uh, gratitude, and they should all be sending you cards, letters, and boxes of chocolate. So I'm really <laughs> glad to have you here. I appreciate that. Um, definitely don't need the chocolate. Once on the lips, forever on the hips. But <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll take that as a compliment. I did get a cookbook from somebody because <laughs> I love to cook. Anyway, uh, I guess it's a natural thing because of the lab. Mad scientists in the lab, mad scientists in the kitchen. It's all about measurements. So anyway. for, for the benefit of anybody that may not already know who you are, can you give us a brief rundown on your illustrious career that caused every troll on earth to attack you? I graduated with a doctorate in veterinary medicine from Texas A&M University. It qualifies me to do genetics because uh, we do have genetics in school as well as the fact that most European laboratories that do any animal testing at all are run by veterinarians. It's not like that in the States. For whatever reason, they prefer PhDs, but it's all the same. Um, as I became allergic to my patients, I ended up going into genetics and um, began doing animal testing and even human testing and forensics, as it turns out. So we did a lot of disease diagnostics and color diagnostics and all types of different things um, with the um, animal DNA, but then we went into paternities and mixed forensics, which is human and animal. Uh, a lot of times, like a murder case, they would send us hair that was found at the crime scene, and we would test it against the knowns from the suspect's house. So different things like that. We've done death penalty cases, innocent project cases. Um, we did a little bit of everything. Um, Every year, we would get a few Sasquatch samples uh, for species identification. However, um, we always just got goats or raccoons or something. It was never anything interesting, and we would laugh about it. I did not believe they existed. I thought people that believed in Sasquatch were believing in some kind of fantasy. I never dreamed they were real. And so um, as far as, as other things I did, I worked on um, the sequence analysis of the World Trade Center uh, victims. Uh, in fact, I recently got a commemorative coin sent to me uh, for my work with that, and which was really touched me because it was a, a great thing to be able to serve my country. I was actually and, about uh, to bring that up from what I had heard when they made up the list of um, who's super expert that can show up here and take squished remains and figure out what it came from that you were really high at the top of the list, basically. Well, we did, and it, there were 22,000 samples that had to be analyzed. There were 
people that were in many parts, and it was terrible, and it mm-hmm. was heartbreaking. And what we learned when we did that was it just would tear your guts out. Um, and but yet we were able to give closure to a lot of families because we would you know analyze the remains and then you know of course match them against family members. And so it was it was a very humbling experience. Um, internationally, I was elected by my peers internationally to chair several genetics committees, uh, horses and dogs and um, what have you, um, on the DNA end of things. And so I served like four terms as, on the horses and one or two on the dogs as chair. So, you know, I, I was at the top of my game until I did Sasquatch. Um, seriously. But on the other I, hand, if we had to, you know, like really put a wish list together and go, who could we wish for that could actually do Bigfoot DNA, you know, Sasquatch DNA genome testing that's like really, really good at it and is going to do a really awesome job on it? You would have been on the top of that wish list, too. Well, maybe. I don't know. I just I didn't I didn't ask for it. It came to me. Uh, I quite did not plan on doing this at all. Cause one, I thought it was a waste of time. I didn't think they were real. And two, uh, <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Uh, but we got asked to do some defamation truth samples. And um, we got a little bit of an interesting find on one of them that was supposed to be a Yeti. Um, but it wasn't enough to do anything definitive at all. And But whenever people found out that we tested that sample, they deluged us with Sasquatch samples. So we had over 100 samples to test. And, you know, I found out by looking at them that the hair looked a lot alike on all of them. Now, I'm not a hair expert, but doing forensics, I knew somebody who was. So the project kind of, we just kind of backed into it at first. And uh, we took the hair and had a hair analyst look at it. And all the unknown hairs were put in one group and the ones that he could identify because he had knowns for every animal in North America. Right. Uh, the ones he could identify, we culled those out before we ever started testing because there were so many and the cost was so prohibitive. And, at, you know, it's gotten a lot cheaper now, but it's it, back then it was extremely expensive to test. So anyway, we went ahead and, and started testing those. And we were not the first to test the mitochondrial DNA on these things. Um, actually, NYU had tested some. Uh, one of Adrian Erickson's samples, the Matilda sample, they had tested, got a human sequence, and Paleo Labs in Canada had tested the same DNA because he split the sample into several portions. And they got the same sequence as NYU, and then when we sequenced it, we got the same sequence. So that was a three-time tested sample, and we all got the same thing, human mitochondrial DNA from that sample. So, you know, I don't claim to be the first as far as the mito. And then the second thing that we did that nobody else had done at that point that I knew of was we went uh, ahead and, and started doing nuclear testing. And we did something that um, would tell us if it was real human or not. Uh, we took a bunch of the samples, uh, the best samples, and sent them in to um, USC and um, had them do what's called a 2.5 million SNP chip, which is a, it's, it's where you take the human point mutations, 2.5 million of them, which is a lot of the genome, pretty much the whole genome, and you test them against the sample. And it has to be above 97% in order to be human, 100% human. Um, I degraded, I drew my own blood and degraded it, let it sit out on the desk till it stunk, <laughs> to put it crudely, um, as a control. And then I put some regular human controls in it. We had like four human controls and then sent in all these Sasquatch samples. And true to being a hybrid, which they are, a human hybrid, um, they showed a pretty wide range of below 97 percent none of them made it to 90 to, to, to 97 percent uh, they were all they ran from 
Oh, I think about 56% to uh, 89%, I think, was the highest one. Because they are not human, but they are also not an ape. So uh, we did that kind of as a screening thing. And this Matilda sample came in. I don't remember her without going to the paper, but she was obviously below human. And we did other tests with her DNA that showed that uh, she actually matched her picture. She carried the red hair gene, and she carried the gene. Well, the skin color gene does not show up. You can do what they call universal primers, which is a way of, it's, a, it's like bookends that delineate a certain sequence in your DNA. And to get that sequence, you can widen it out a little bit and, and create primers that'll test like all mammals. So that's what we did. They're called universal primers because it was it would test any mammal. And it had to do with skin color. And a lot of them have gray skin color. And Matilda had gray skin color. And so uh, when we ran all these samples on this 2.5 million SNP chip, uh, it came in as not a single one of them uh, had any SNPs related to that gene. And then we, we ran the gene separately with universal primers, and we still did not get anything. So their sequence for their skin color is totally different than anything on the planet. And it won't work with your universal primers, which is very interesting. So she had the gray skin, and she had absolutely no reaction anywhere or no sequence anywhere for skin color. And so that right there would prove that she was not a human. You know, that matches up perfectly with the description of Xana from over there in the Caucasus Mountains, where all the eyewitness reports say she had gray skin, too. Yeah. um, I don't know about her, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Back to Matilda. She had the red hair. She had the, the skin tone and the lack of... That's where negative results actually told you something. Because she should have run. And uh, she was also female. We only had two or three females in the study out of 100-something samples. So with that said, um, you know, if you did it statistically, just that one skin color gene would throw it into infinity of her being a human being. She's not a human, but yet she's, you know, got human mitochondrial DNA. So it was a well-worked-up sample. Regrettably, we ran out of DNA on her. Um but, and as far as Zaina, we have a tooth from Zaina and from Quit. Uh, yep. we're, if yeah, we, I'm showing everybody the picture of the tooth right now, by the way. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to do them or not. It'll depend on how much research money we raise. They're at the bottom of the heap because uh, Dr. Gilbert at Copenhagen, who's a very good scientist, allegedly ran her and the results did not turn out like they were expected to be. I would like to verify his findings uh, if we keep getting some donations. Uh, I would like to run those two because it would be huge if he truly is a Sasquatch and not a uh, African. Um, it would be huge for the simple reason that we have a half hybrid with quit. And supposedly not only she had these these attributes, but he had them too. He had great strength. Allegedly, he could he could pick up a a chair with somebody sitting in it with his teeth. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at the picture of him, he's a really rugged looking dude too. Right, but I do believe their human fraction, if they're more than human, the human fraction I do believe is African though, mm-hmm. because all of the children look like African Americans or what have you. They have uh, the hair and the, the wide you know, the nose. Baby. Yeah. Yeah. So, Actually, I don't know if you've talked to Rich Soul at all, but he's on that too with the uh, Nuke Seven E uh, saliva DNA marker thing. That again is from the uh, tiny population somewhere in Sub-Saharan North Africa, and might be a potential marker for Sasquatch too. Well, we don't know because we weren't allowed to load it up into GenBank. We did get it compared in GenBank and others. But we were not allowed to upload our results. And that's on my website uh, where they kept just putting us off and asking for 
signed consent forms from them and everything else stupid. Anything to keep us from uploading our data, mm-hmm. which was not right. But we were able to compare it. So we so, do know what they are and everything. So they still haven't uploaded your data. They're still being obstinate and unscientific, huh? Yeah, of course. It's the government. They don't mm-hmm. want it out there. Nobody wants to go to a national park where they're being stared at by giant hairy creatures. I don't know. I do it all the time. I think it's relaxing. Well, I mean, I think <laughs> You know, I think that people with little children and stuff are going to avoid it, maybe. Yeah. Um, I There's ways I, around all that, though. I mean, they got certain areas they like to hang around, and you put up a sign, hey, Bigfoot baby season, stay out. Take it down again midsummer. There are problems yeah, solved. You know, the problem is, with all of it, is that, you know, the government just doesn't want it out there. One mm-hmm. of those things, they don't want it out there. And so, you know, they made sure of that when we started to publish the paper. Um, they absolutely got to all the journals. We had to find a new journal. And they apparently it was under the radar, so that's the only re- reason we were able to publish. Uh, we did get our peer reviews we needed, and we did. We ended up having to buy the journal to actually get it out because they backed out within two hours of when it was to go live and published. The lawyers called the guy and said, do not publish this. It will ruin you. And so they backed out of publishing it. They had gotten the peer reviews and everything. We didn't. Um, and they backed out two hours before it was supposed to go live. So we ended up having to buy that journal to get the peer reviews that we didn't do and to get the to be able to publish it. And that's perfectly kosher. Um as far as the rules, um, we have that on the website too. All right, back to how we were, how we tried to publish. Um, when we got ready to publish the paper, it was obvious the government didn't want it out because we cleared the first round at Nature. And being a peer reviewer, normally if you clear the first round and you make the changes in the paper that the peer reviewers request, you eventually get it published, whether it takes one or two or three rounds or whatever. Uh, we did everything they requested, and when we came back to Nature, after we passed the first round, uh, we had one that wouldn't review it again, one that had reviewed it and passed it and said that he, was no, he wasn't qualified to do this. <laughs> he was the first round, but not the second round. We had one that didn't even read the paper both times because he asked for stuff that was already in the paper. And the third one, he just made fun of it. He was not serious at all. It was very unprofessional. And his final take on it was, I just don't believe it. So those are not peer reviews. Yeah, that's and not they, scientific. I don't believe it. it has nothing to do with the evidence. I know, and that's exactly what, I mean, it, they're on my website. You can read the peer reviews. And um, the other thing they kept blaming it on was contamination. And on my YouTube channel, I have a, a whole video on contamination we have proof it was not contaminated because you get a when you run a lot of these tests you get a graphic representation of the sequence or whatever you're testing and if it's like a overhead projector in school where you have a transparency that you lay on top of something if you have two profiles in there say you got a human and you got a dog in the same profile you're going to have peaks that overlap like you've laid one profile on top of the other and it's real easy to tell when it's contaminated for that reason we did not have contamination we're used to dealing with doing forensics you get contaminated samples all the time or mixed samples where you have more than one contributor we are used to dealing with that that was not an issue at all so um and that's why i put out that that video because Everybody was saying, oh, it's contaminated. And, and there, that's just the only thing they could come up with to try to fault it. Because there was nothing wrong with the science at all. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, the, uh, we went to nature first, and then they turned us down on the second round, not the first round, which means it should have published. And then the second, the next thing that happened was I went to PLOS because I peer reviewed for them. And they're pretty easy to to get past, I mean, they'll publish stuff they really probably shouldn't. And they wouldn't even take it for peer review. And they'll take any old garbage. (laughs) 
And so, um, I mean, I, I did a Chinese paper. We had, I think it took us four rounds before they got it in enough shape that we could actually, you know, use it. And so I know that they should. They all, And also, I believe it was them that published a new ape in Africa that had not even... Not even one tenth of the amount of um, DNA sequence that we had, and that was just on short term. That wasn't the whole genomes or any of the longer stuff. This was just little short gene sequences. They basically did mitochondrial DNA and didn't even do as much as we did. So, so yeah, they, they declared that, that a known species, and they won't even look at your work. Exactly. Exactly. Which one is this? It was a uh, Homo floresiensis or Homo luzon? No, no. This was a monkey. Oh, was monkey. Not one of the teeny humanoids. Got it. No, at the time, I don't believe they had done the genome for the Homo florensis yet. Florensis. So um, that was not done. That was later. But regardless of it, they're different anyway. I'm sorry. Um, they're different anyway. They, uh, they're comparable to other hominids. And the thing is, Sasquatch is not. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of unknown DNA in them. And when you look, you use the, there's a national depository called GenBank. And what GenBank is, it's where every scientist, when they get a new sequence, they upload it to GenBank, or even if they get another of the same sequence, like say more than one human sample, they'll go ahead and upload it. And then it's used supercomputers to compare all of this. And whenever you compare it, then you say, well, it'll come back 99% human, 95% human, or what have you. It gives you the top species that it's similar to if it's different. We got nothing similar. Nothing. On the, on the paternal side. On so the nuclear people. DNA, there's nothing even remotely close to match it with. Well, there's, there is, because there's human and stuff, but there's this huge chunk of unknown that there's nothing to compare to at all. Mm -hmm. Zero. And so, uh, it, and it, even in the smaller sequences before we did the genomes, we would, I have a letter from one of the scientists at one of the labs we outsourced to it's a very good lab, and they're accredited. And it's a letter from one of the PhDs there that asked me, because we blasted this sequence, and he, she says, it's a perfect, clear sequence. She said it is, um, you can even see the primers on both ends. And it's so clear, and it's 100 bases shorter than it's supposed to be. And we put it in GenBank, and it came up, nothing matches it. Have you discovered a new species? I have it in writing. They ran the test. They blasted it in GenBank, which means search through GenBank, and came up with nothing. Well, when we this is something I really haven't released yet. I'll talk more about it, but some of the newer findings, you know, we got the percentages of unknown, and they're large. So in the paper, we already at it with some of these others like we kind of targeted the the Y chromosome we had so many males that we targeted the Y chromosome because we wanted to know who the daddies were and we did various different tests from sequencing some of the gene uh, some of the, the amylogen and gene which is a, a gene um, that's used in forensics for uh, sex determination and we also um, did YSTRs, which is the male equivalent of mitochondrial DNA in that you can trace back your male lineage all the way through your ancestors through this. Because all male lineages will follow down. For instance, if you have a son, your, your YSTRs are going to be identical to your YSTRs. Just like a female, the mitochondrial DNA is going to be the same as the mother in all of her children. But it doesn't pass down from the male. 
how many generations down for, from the original mother does the does her mito DNA pass? Well, infinitely, really. So, but not with the males. No, yes, with the males, it's just a different test. It's a it's a nuclear test, mm-hmm. and it has to do with the Y chromosome. It's got these little fragments, length fragments uh, called STRs, uh, short tandem repeats. Um that these length fragment fragments will identify you and all of your male offspring and all your male ancestors. So if you basically came from a, let's just say you came from a Middle Eastern lineage, that Middle Eastern lineage will carry all the way down because it doesn't change really mm-hmm. unless there's a mutation. So you can trace back, you know, many, many, many generations and thousands of years with it. Just, you know, that's why they talk about the mitochondrial Eve. Well, this is basically the, the YSTR atom. So you can go way back. And this is these are some of the things we use to age these things. Um, but anyway, they did not run well on the YSTRs. They do not have them. I, I only got a few hits on like one of them, and we did a whole panel of them. So they are not. It's just not human. It's it's not human. It's unknown. And so we had, we've got this unknown male contributor. Um, so it, you know, it was very interesting because we couldn't link it to anything. I mean, some people say it's gigantopithecus. Well, well, the majority <clears throat> is unknown DNA and. Now they've got Gigantopithecus, and it's an orangutan, and, I mean, they're all related. Yeah. I, I know just, enough about primatology to be a, debunk that one just by looking at their foot morphology, so you can forget about that silly notion. Yeah, well, I'm a, in agreement, but I'm saying the DNA will also tell you there's no orangutan in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and there, they don't know that gig- – has anybody extracted Giganto DNA yet? I hadn't heard no, that they, they have. have. I, I, yeah, they have now. That's why they know it's a precursor to an orangutan. There you go. So it's not related to Bigfoot, period. No, not Gigantopithecus. Nope. And so, um, but they are genetically engineered, and there is some weirdness in there that I haven't released. But I will be releasing it after this. Because uh, we, oh, two or three years after the original, um, the original study, we ended up getting the whole genomes analyze we have a pie chart of everything there on those genomes and part of this study is going to be to also um, part of this study is going to be to also um, run a couple more samples to make just to conclude the other we have pie charts and everything that shows uh, exactly what's in them now Uh, we had bioinformatics done uh, they were compared to everything in GenBank and other. Um, there's another depository, too, that we also looked at. So we know what's in them now. Uh, we know that naturally it should not occur. Uh, but it's there and they don't follow the rules of general hybridization because normally, like I'll use a horse as an example, a horse and a donkey make a mule. A mule is sterile. Yeah. Same with ligers, which are lions and tigers. They'll mate and may produce offspring, but they're sterile. But yep. we all know that these are not sterile, that it works. And we took the paper even further. We actually took the DNA and, and did electron microscopy on it. And it was weird because we had nice, long, healthy strands of DNA, but there were what they call single-stranded gaps. Um, anybody that knows anything about DNA knows it's a double helix. It has two strands. It's like, and it looks like a ladder that you've just twisted. So they call it a double helix. Well, we had like a single strand for long period, long places in this, in their DNA. And what that came from was the hybridization because it didn't have an aligning sequence to make the double helix. So it was just single there for, you know, several thousand bases. So it looks like somebody cut the DNA strand and spliced in pieces where they wanted them. That's why I said it's basically genetically genetic engineering, uh, but it's beyond 
what we've had technology for until very recently. Um, and these things are thousands of years old. So right. whoever put it together um, has more technology than we do. Right. So either you're talking, you know, uh, other other than humans or vanished human civilization or aliens, but somebody a long, long time ago was playing with their uh, mad scientist uh, genetic tinker toys and they created this, which would make yeah, you wonder how many other of these cryptids that have been reported for hundreds of years are the result of the same sort of tinkering and chimeras and all that sort of thing. I want you to consider this. Now, we have dog, dog man DNA. I've got one full genome already, and I've got two samples that are good samples, and they both had human mitochondrial DNA. Um, and those results will be coming out when we finish the second genome. Um, but what's interesting is if you think, of, think about Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Sumerian mythology, it's really not mythology because these creatures still exist today. And... If you think about it, there's goat man. Pan. Pan is a goat man. Yep. You have to look at the statues over there. The ancient statues that you can see in Rome are Pompeii. Um, you know, I can, new, I can show you a picture of a satyr. A woman that was a fan of my show, didn't want to be identified, sent me pictures. This weird thing was following me through the forest for about 45 minutes. And as I was just about to outrun it and get out of the forest, I spotted it sitting on a rock, took a picture. It's a satyr. Yeah. And there's one that lives about 10 miles from here. That, I mean, some of the high-level people in the community have seen it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's definitely a goat man or a satyr or whatever you want to call them. Yep. They also there's, call them fawns, F-A-U-N. That was another name. Yeah, them. that too. I mean, there's another number of names for them. Pan is the name of the god. Yep. Um, but Anubis is the name of a dog man. And then there's also the, um, you know, I mean, really, you can pretty well take care of every cryptid if you go back to mythology. So yeah. at this I truly believe, since these things date back to before the flood, that these things um, would appear to people. And since they can, and there's a lot of reports of what they call woo, of supernatural things being able to be done by these things. Now, if people saw it back then, they would turn them into gods. I even have a saying for it. My saying is, show mankind a little supernatural and they will run after it and worship it mm -hmm. because they don't, they can't explain it. I mean, I've seen things I can't explain. I'm not going to go into it, but I've seen a lot that I can't explain. So with that said, I believe that it all ties in through the ages. I mean, because we actually in the paper have a picture of a coin that has a Bigfoot on it from 500 BC. So, you know, yep. there, there had to be interaction somehow with something that either had technology or whatever to make these things like they are. Let me give you th three quick literary historical examples. The story of Beowulf is the oldest story in the English language still extant in its original written form. What does it have in it? A cave, that, a cave troll named Grendel that doesn't like noisy neighbors and comes out and beats a snot out of them. Sounds a lot like a Sasquatch. <laughs> then if you go back further, you've got the Epic of Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh is this giant who's 15 feet tall, and he goes around and stomps monsters' butts. And the locals tell him that there's a scary thing that lives near their area. He hasn't actually hurt anybody, but he, he scares people because he's big. Can, can you come and scare this monster away, too? Well, you know, there's a couple different versions of this, but the one I heard, basically, uh, this wild man basically defeats him, but then becomes his friend and his sidekick and goes on all these other adventures with him, killing monsters and stuff. And when his sidekick Enkidu, the wild man, finally gets killed, then he goes in search of his final quest to try and find immortality so he won't die too like Enkidu did because he's, you know, his, his, his fighting buddy died. Oh, well. You can go back even further in time than that. If you look at the Sanskrit epics, uh, the Ramayana, talks about when Lord Rama's girlfriend was stolen by Ravana and was taken to the island of Sri Lanka, which was named after 
the demon god Lanka. <laughs> that was his island. And he had a whole army of giants that he was using to guard that island. And Rama didn't have any way to really invade. He didn't have a navy. He didn't have enough uh, vimanas for an air force. So his buddies built this huge, long stone bridge spanning from the Indian continent to Sri Lanka, which is supposed to be about 10 miles long and half mile wide, which they then used to invade. And his buddies that built this bridge for him also, you know, really wanted to help invade, kill all the giants. They were the Venara. The description of the Venara is they're Sasquatch, essentially. <laughs> So this is not only goes back at least 6,000 years, because guess what? They did a satellite survey of that section of the ocean, and the remains of that bridge is still there. And they sent archaeological team down to look at it. And after a couple of years of digging and looking at it, they concluded two things. First of all, not natural. And secondly, at least five, 6,000 years old. Yeah. So that goes back to even before that. And this was, you know, one of the uh, demigods that were running around pulling the strings at that time, had a, a run-in with the Giants, and who did he get to team up with them? The Sasquatch. And they were more than happy to build a bridge so they could go invade and kill all, all the Giants. So there you go. It doesn't matter where you go back in history, you're going to find that there's been stuff written about them. You know, even in Europe, in I Germany, mean. they've got Der Wildermann. In uh, Britain, in, in the Isles up there, they've got the uh, Wood Woes. You know, all over Europe, everywhere you go, there's names for them. Oh, yeah, they're all over the world. There's no doubt about that, and there's other things, too, besides, I mean, I like Dog Man. Uh, let's take it back even further. Uh, you got the Book of Enoch, which mm -hmm. talks about, it's an apocryphal book, but it talks about how, about the Nephilim and how they were formed from, you know, fallen angels made these things. Mm -hmm. And they, had, they contained animals and people and everything else. So, you know, you've got all of this historical background on it. And it it all, you know, kind of corroborates everything, which is interesting. And talking about dogmen, there's also a YouTube video where written by a monk hundreds and hundreds of years ago, where he writes about a city of dogmen. And it's a very interesting, it's almost scientifically written. And um, Marco Polo talked about running into them, too. And then there was the Catholic St. Christopher that was supposed to be a dogman yeah. that converted. And there's lots of old tapestries and illustrations from the olden days that show where these kings would hire these dogman soldiers because they were incredibly nasty mercenaries. And they would have, if they could afford them, they would have them in their armies because they're pretty much guaranteed to stomp the enemy's butt 100 <laughs> percent, although they charged a lot. So all of this kind of stuff is all in, in these old histories. There's even stories in North America from a couple of the native tribes here that at one point they had tribes living near them that were these dog-headed people. Yes, they exist. And I've seen one. Uh, my farm help had a close encounter, and he was a military man, and it scared the wits out of him. And that was unexpected because he was pretty fearless. He had been in war and everything, and he still... I mean, he was shaking when he came up and told me what he saw. So, I mean, you know, they've been around for ages and they continue to be around um, all of these things, not just the Bigfoot. So that's why I'm very interested in doing the study we're doing now, which we're going to do some more Bigfoot work and we're going to finish up the dogman samples. Um, if anybody ha out there has any good hair samples from any of these types of cryptids, any of them, or even a merman or a mermaid, uh, any type of strange creature that they're pretty sure it's, it's, you know, it's got a good chain of custody kind of to the point that they are sure what they have. We would love to have a sample. If you find a Thunderbird feather, bring that sucker in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to see that. There's enough people that I've seen one of those things. Obviously, they exist. Somebody grab a feather from one of them. They're black. Yeah, because feathers do contain DNA. You can't extract the feathers. So, you know, teeth or, or hair are the best two options on any of these things. But, um, you know, it, we would like to tie this all together because my theory is they're all going to be related. They're going to have human mothers. I think they're all going to be a hybrid of some sorts. So and how, how many how many uh, uh, Sasquatch DNA samples did you actually test? It was over 100, wasn't it? 
And I think it was 106 or something like that. I, it was it was over 100, and then we have more that came in after the study. I'm going to do a couple of those, just confirmation with the hair. So and, every every single one of them across the board, then, if I'm ex understanding this correctly, came across as a uh, hybrid with human female. None of them were like pure blood, although you don't know exactly what that would be anyway. Right. Now, all the samples we tested, the mitochondrial DNA was human. And they they were mostly Middle Eastern or European. We only had a few outliers. Everybody thought there'd be a lot of Native American, and it wasn't. We only had one or two, two, I think, mm -hmm. that were Native American. And, I mean, y'all can go look at the paper on SasquatchGenomeProject.org and, and do the count. I mean, it's been a few years, so I haven't. But I'm close on it, I can tell you that much. We had a couple of... of African samples, but the, all of those were outliers, and we even kind of had a theory. When you got a hybrid, you don't know exactly when it happened. So one thought is that, say, one is one of the African ones could have been like a slave that escaped and ended up mating with a Sasquatch, because there's a lot of, of stories from the Pacific Northwest where they would, and I know a native chief up there that I mean, he knows. He has relatives that are part Sasquatch. They used to take the maiden. And, uh, uh, yeah, I know. I heard that. There's like two or three tribes up there that didn't think that it was like a bad thing for uh, a native woman yeah, to have a Bigfoot husband. They don't let anybody have any DNA. It's a shame because that would be huge because we could, you know, follow it down through the generations. But mm -hmm. And he even knows where the daddy Sasquatch is buried, but they won't. they won't reveal it. So it's a moot point um, how far back do you think um uh, let's i think i think what you're getting at is there was a progenitor of pure blood at some point that hybridized how far back was that uh 13 in general 13 to sixteen thousand years generally the african outliers were twenty five thousand years but once again i'm not so sure that that's when they actually came into existence because uh, that could have been at any point in history where, um, you know, perhaps a escaped slave or something uh, had been hiding in the woods and ended up incorporated into a clan. So that's very definitely could happen because one thing about hybridization, you can only uh, guess whenever um, as to when the hybridization occurred. And you can only do that by the amount of, of say, human DNA in it. Right. I mean. But after just so many generations, it, you know, it's going to change and lower. So anyway, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting theory that I think they're all interrelated. And that's what I want to prove. Um, but also it will just give us more information about what the makeup on all of these things are. And well, keep, I keeping in mind that a lot of their presuppositions on who was where and when they died out are pretty much guesswork because they have recently found out uh, Homo Nadali down in southern Africa. They had presumed got extinct way before humans, modern humans were in the area and they found some remains in a cave that were like not that old. So they were wrong about that, too. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm not dead set on the timing, but um, you can do it fairly well because. Where it's, what it's based on is, say, a mutation every thousand years or something. And so you can kind of, you know, trace back the different mutations, and that's how they kind of age the DNA. Um, you know, what really it, strikes me from what you just told me is that uh, – uh, oh, go ahead. I said it's, it's a rough guide as to how old they think the sample is. Um, you know, you can argue, argue it both ways, but let's just say one thing it will prove is they're not ancient. At right. all. Ancient would be, you know, well, it ha they have to have existed from the time that we have modern humans, for sure, right. for the same reason that their mothers are modern human. Yeah, and, and how far back does that go, though? Well. That, that's another thing that keeps getting extended all the time is the timeline on how old our modern humans seems to go back way further than what they're willing to admit. Right, but who knows if that's right or not either. It's still theory. Yeah. And I don't think we'll ever really get to the bottom of that. But but you can use kind of a rule of thumb and get an idea. But let's just say that they couldn't have existed before us. And there's a lot of people out there now saying, oh, they're ancient peoples. They were before us. 
maybe their their progenitor, their male progenitor could have been before us, but the actual Sasquatch, since they're human hybrids, uh, they definitely are younger than the human race. Which brings to mind two questions. First of all, you mentioned the African outlier, so let's not bring that up. But in this general discussion, you're talking about hybridization happening like 13, 16,000 years ago. That's the height of the Ice Age. There are lots of animals not making it through the Ice Age. And there could have been other things that we're not aware of because of the geological record isn't complete enough. It was too close to the surface. Could have, you know, we know that there were some major eruptions in North America about five, 6,000 years ago. We also know there was a meteor that slammed into uh, northern Greenland about 12,000 years ago, which could have been what ended the Ice Age in the first place. And then they've been trying to say that the uh, North Americans came across the Beringia land bridge during the last Ice Age, which is just recently proven as complete hogwash. And they found 23,000-year-old tracks in Arizona in the rock. So a lot of the stuff they talk about doesn't line up. But here's what I'm wondering if at some point, and we know there's been bottlenecks, like humans almost completely died off and the Tobe eruption, eruption happened. They figured no more than a thousand mating humans survived that pairs to continue us on. We almost died off completely. So being that there's these massive uh, catastrophes at fairly regular intervals, is it just possible that during that last stressor period where a lot of the species were dying off, that's when the progenitor, whatever it was, actually started hybridizing with humans, and that's where the modern Sasquatch came from? Well, that's, that's probably as good as anything. Uh, or, you, you know, some people are going to believe that aliens have created them all. Others are going to believe the biblical account that, um, you know, they were formed um, – they were originally the men of old, the men of renown in Genesis 6. And then, you know, as it progressed, others, other things were formed. So there's a lot of, of different theories out there. But every one of them, the one thing that comes from all of it is we were before them because they have human mothers. Mm -hmm. That's the point I want to drive home because there seems to be a lot of people thinking that they're ancient peoples that are that were before us and that's just not true it can't be because they have human mothers right the current ones what about the progenitors though i heard through somebody that's connected inside the deep state and was collecting dna samples way before you did a study by the way for nato oh, yeah. that yeah. they had already decided that most of the sasquatch were hybrids but they also said there was a pure blood and apparently it's still around wherever the hell it is well i wouldn't doubt it because you know, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of things. I mean, if you want to go into some weird science, you know, uh, rumor has it that uh, they found the remains of, you know, the chained fallen angels allegedly. And uh, if if you believe the biblical account, that could account that they yes, there's there's still a purebred around that would have been a male progenitor, mm -hmm. but. You know, I'm, I'm not, people are going to believe what they're going to believe. I'm not trying to convince anybody, right. but uh, there's, there's so many different ways to look at it. And I never say never because I used to say, I used to say they never would exist. And now I've learned so much that I, I say the older I get, the less I know because I keep learning. New things. And yeah, for a long time, I didn't want to believe in any supernatural hokey pokey of any kind, but I keep seeing more and more examples of it, and it gets harder and harder to deny it. And at some point, you're just lying to yourself because you're seeing clear-cut examples of strange things going on that we cannot clearly identify, and we don't have any kind of borders on what is this phenomenon. And that's how it gets lumped into the category of paranormal, supernatural, or woo, because we don't have the scientific uh, mnemonic tools to describe the phenomenon or understand the mechanics of what's making it happen well enough to describe the phenomenon. So it's magic hokey pokey because our scientists can't describe it. Well, scientists generally don't believe in anything uh, of any sort of supernatural. Um, right. Most right. of them are atheists, actually. Uh, but, I know, because I, I was amongst them. <laughs> right, but what I'm saying is some of the stuff they claim is supernatural, you go do the scientific tests on it. You know, you have a theory, 
and you come up with a way to test it and you do the same test over and over again and keep getting the same result, it's not supernatural anymore. Well, you know, with all the reports on the Sasquatch, the DNA is there. They're a physical creature. Yep. But they also are like nothing that is else is on this earth. And I prove that with the fact that the hair does not yield DNA. If you take a mammal and you cut off a, a chunk of the hair shaft, you're going to get DNA from it. I mean, if it's a brand new born baby and the hair is so fine, there may not be enough DNA to show up. But let's just say generally with any species on the planet that's a mammal that has hair, you're going to get mitochondrial DNA out of that hair shaft. You cannot do it with Sasquatch. We spent three months troubleshooting that. Three months. And we changed reagents. We changed protocols. You know, my second author test, they had a state-of-the-art robotic system. And they robotically extracted. And it came down finally. We put it on the spectrometer because we didn't know if there were inhibitors in the hair or whether it was just no DNA. And there was no DNA in that hair. And it had a medulla. It had everything it should have had to have the DNA. But yet it has no DNA when you try to extract it. And, you know, it's the only animal slash primate slash hominin that I have ever heard of that does not give mitochondrial DNA. I can, you know, and, and I'll make the caveat about some very fine baby hair, but. Basically, this is coarse hair. It should have given us gobs of DNA, and it didn't. And um, this is bizarre. It, and it's in the paper. And they did this site study. And uh, they actually take a swipe at me saying contamination, which is, I've got the graphic proof there is no contamination. But, but that's beside the point. They had seven samples that didn't run. They also Those had some samples that they had Robert Kreider go out in the field and collect for him and send to him that they didn't bother to test. Well, and he that. also said the Yeti hair that the uh, Yeti hunter uh, in the Himalayas collected from inside of a hollow tree was a, a formerly unknown species of polar bear presumed to be extinct for 20,000 years, which, by the way, a survey of all the bear DNA from around the Himalayas just came out and said that's complete and utter bullshit. Sykes is a fraud. Well, um, bless his heart, he's passed on now. Don't want to talk bad about the dead. but I don't care. <laughs> I talked bad about him when he was alive. I'm not changing my opinion now that he's dead. Well, I'm, I'm going to criticize the paper, though. Within six months, Cambridge had a, another paper published about the bear thing. So he was wrong on the bear. But what I found interesting was the seven samples that they, and he couldn't figure out why, even though he had read my paper, because he had contacted me. Uh, seven samples did not yield mitochondrial DNA, and all they used was hair shafts. Those seven samples came from people from my study. So we had tested those samples. We knew they were Sasquatch samples, but they only used, they didn't use the hair roots that you have to have to test for Sasquatch. They used the hair shafts. So those seven samples were from my study, and they didn't run, and they wouldn't have run. It just supported what I already said. So it's kind of interesting. And then they try to get me on contamination, which I find hysterical. So, you know, the paper and I'll, I'll tell you something else that's really interesting about that paper. Um, they credit the Fish and Wildlife uh, Lab here in Ashland, Oregon, with screening the hair samples. Well, let me tell you a little something. I was an invited speaker to speak on animal forensics when they put on a, a forensics meeting up there. And I met those people, including the director. And whenever I found out that he was doing this and they were supposed to be screening, I called him. And I said, hey, you know, I already did a big paper on this. Uh, why are you just going to do the motto on this? And he kind of argued around. He said, well, I'm just going to do it. I want to do it. OK, fine. Um, I said, well, I know you got bodies. Not here we don't. I said, yeah, but y'all got bodies. I know you got bodies. He says, you know, I can't talk about that. At least you didn't lie. Mm -hmm. But when, it, when the Sykes paper came out and they credited it, let me tell you something. 
they had wolf and everything else in there. And the uh, the wolf hair is so easy to tell because it's got kind of a, a spoon-like thing on the end uh, to shed water. And uh, whenever Sykes was was testing all these samples, they had all these different species. Those are the best hair analysts for animals in the world at that lab. They would not have missed all those samples. So either it was a put-up job or else they never screened them, even though they were credited with screening and the director told me they were going to. So, you know, the whole thing is just suspect in my mind. Again, uh, Robert Kreider was picked to go out in the field, find fresh Bigfoot hair samples or DNA samples by the local university, not knowing who they were connected to. Went out there, did it, documented the whole chain of custody. I've shown this on my show. We got the video of everything all the way down the line, including the positive air pressure system that he's using to take them from where he had them to put them into the other container and label it and the whole thing. And he sends it off to Dr. Meldrum, who then claims that he loses them. You yeah. ever heard of a chain of custody, supposed doctor? Meldrum. Well, as it turns out, he actually did send them over to Sykes, which he was told specifically not to. And Sykes not only didn't test them, he sent them to Luzon, Switzerland, where they're still sitting. Well, you know, that's the whole thing. The government's behind the cover up and nothing's going to get done unless you do it privately and, you know, do it kind of how we've done it. We did not tell these labs what they were testing. We just paid them and said, we need these samples tested. And thus and such is what we want done. That gets a more yeah. accurate, unbiased result anyway. They have no idea what they're testing. Let's see what you think exactly. it is. Yeah, and thus the letter say, asking or saying, have you discovered any species? And uh, so, you know, it, it's really a, been an interesting ride with all this and the way all, the, all of the many, many journals would not take us at all. Wouldn't even consider it after nature took it. And only one in one in ten papers in Nature actually even makes it to the peer review, and we made it through the first peer review and still, you know. And then things changed. Mm -hmm. Somebody got a hold of them. Is what happened? And so, you know, and and then I've had people that have worked with me that have been threatened by the government. Um, we had a, I'm sure it was a government operative sitting beside our lab at one point, and we, when we went out to try to talk to him, boy, he took off. So, you know, I mean, it was a small town, so everybody knows everybody. And this guy stuck out with us like a sore, sore thumb. And where he parked, nobody would ever park. So it was really strange. Uh, so I know that it's, there's cover up. And then there's people that are haters that, uh, you know, they're jealous. They want to be the first one to discover it. Well, I got news. I'm not even the first one. I'm just no. the first one to go public with it. <laughs> you know the guy that developed taxonomy Linnaeus actually classified them uh, yeah they were discovered a long time ago oh yeah but I'm talking some real science but yeah well science that was the only science there was he invented taxonomy and he, he said yeah these things are real here they, here they are here's what we call them well, homo ferris yeah. and this is something that I'm going to leave a teaser because this will come out with the new information I had a whistleblower that was dying contact me Okay, things. hold on. Hold on. First of all, we got to take a break because if I keep trying to run the program much longer, it's not going to record. It's going to crash. So we're going to stop okay. recording.
Okay, this is the video everybody's been waiting for. Um, this video is to show how we knew we did not have contamination um, whenever we did the Sasquatch Genome Project, when we did the paper. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the peer reviews and uh, how they kept saying that the samples had to have been contaminated and so rejected the paper on those grounds. And then we're going to show you how we could determine with multiple types of testing that there was no contamination in the samples. And I'm going to show you actual uh, data, some actual data and some data that I had to actually um, put together to show contamination since our samples weren't contaminated. So um, we'll go through each of these slides and I'll explain a little about it. We're going to talk first of all a little bit about um, the nature reviews and about how um, the methods that we use to remove contamination prior to extraction of the DNA. Um, I don't have a video of me washing the samples, but we have a little vortexer that is extremely vigorous and uh, rapidly moving. And what you do is you put um, an alcohol and uh, water combination into the uh, the actual onto the actual samples hair in this case and you vortex them with this professional vortexer which will uh, shake loose any loose cells because that's where the that you know where you touch something you'll leave a cell which contains DNA and uh, this shakes loose any cells and we did this multiple times per sample to make sure that there was absolutely no foreign DNA on the hair that the only DNA that was there was in the actual hair um, so we did this to every sample we could. Now, of course, there were some samples in the study that we couldn't wash, those being saliva samples or um, other liquid samples. Um, but there's not a problem with that because you can always tell if they're contaminated or if it's a mixed profile whenever you um, move forward into the actual DNA testing. Um, the, con the contamination would have been visually obvious when doing the DNA testing using, you know, three different methods, and we used all of these uh, when we did our testing in the manuscript. Um, the sequencing using universal primers as well as standard sequencing, um, and we'll get into how this relates in a minute with some pictures. Uh, we did PowerPlex 16 screening of Sasquatch samples, which is your forensic profiling with um, STRs, and we'll get into that in a minute also. We also used negative and positive controls to assure ourselves that no laboratory personnel had contaminated the samples. And if they had, we would have been able to determine who had contaminated it in the lab because every lab person in a forensic lab has their profiles on file so that if there is a band in the negative control you can determine um, it uh, if it came from a person in the lab. Uh, not only that, negative controls, um, you know, if, if you haven't uh, if you've got a, a chemical or something that's contaminated, regardless of who or where it got contaminated, it'll it'll show it'll amplify and show up as a band in your negative control. And you do more than one. You do uh, what's called a uh, an extraction blank, which means that you have your solution that you put in when you extract your samples, and um, you run that in a lane and run it through uh, to see if there's any, any DNA showing up in, in your extraction um, buffers, first of all. Uh, and then you have also your a negative amplifi amplification control, which means after you've done your PCR, you will um, run a PCR along with your other samples that are, that is, um, doesn't have any DNA added to it and if DNA shows up in that negative amplification blank then you know that something in the amplification is contaminated and you also use a positive control to show that your your um, PCR is actually working and um, and your extractions are working so uh, with that in mind we'll go to the next slide and talk about nature peer reviews um, there were two rounds at Nature. The first round um, was better than the second one after we did so much more work. 
um, reviewer one, um, on the first review, he actually passed the paper with revision. Um, he said it was nature worthy, and um, but it needed to have some revision. And he gave a lot of small corrections, um, you know, verbiage or things that we said he didn't like. And we corrected all of those and responded um, to his review. Uh, in fact, we responded to every review we received from each of the reviewers. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, you can see where to go actually read all of these peer reviews, including the passing reviews we got from the James Journal before um, acquiring it along with those peer reviews. Um, reviewer, back to Nature Reviews. Reviewer number two on his first review, he didn't read the manuscript. Um, he asked us to use universal species identification test on the mitochondrial DNA, and that was already in the paper and it had already been done. Um, he didn't ask to see any of the electropherograms, uh, the graphic representation of this, the te that the testing was done. He also asked for whole mitochondrial genomes, and we already had a number of those in the paper, uh, so he didn't read it or he would have seen them. He also wanted more nuclear DNA, so we this triggered us to sequence the three whole genomes prior to resubmission. Um, reviewer number three, his first review was was unprofessional. I mean, it was laughable. He he's obviously not uh, English or American uh, or any English speaking country because his English was very poor. And I quoted it on this slide and left it exactly as it was written. And uh, basically, he's saying that it means that our testing showed that a Caucasian Roman woman had to run around having in the forest having sex with a hominid and left the baby to it. And uh, <laughs> so he was making fun of us. He didn't even give a serious review. And I complained about this to the editors at Nature. So he was professional in his second review, but still, um, as you can see, we'll address that on the next page. Um, reviewer number four was more professional. He made a list of grievances, um, and the thing, one of the things that got me about him was he said, oh, the hair analysis has to be wrong. He says, but I'm not a hair analyst and I'm not an expert in it. Uh, then you shouldn't comment on it saying that the analysis is wrong when you're not a hair expert. Only a hair expert can say that. Um, he did make a valid point about wanting more data, which we gladly provided by sequencing the three whole genomes prior to resubmission. However, none of these people asked to see any of our raw data, which normally they don't. I mean, when you submit a paper for publication, um, they come in and they read it, and I don't know of a case where they've asked to see the raw data. But if they were going to call contamination, they should have asked to see the raw data, and they didn't. On the second submission to Nature, um, Suddenly, the reviewer number one suddenly says he's not qualified to review the paper after he's already reviewed it. And he says he'll go along with whatever anybody else says, uh, the other reviewers, that, you know, he, uh, even though Nature sent it to him and thought he obviously was qualified to review it, after one review, he decides the second review that he, he's not qualified, so he's not going to, he's not going to, he'll just go along with whatever the other reviewers say. So reviewer two, now, um, he was the one that didn't read the, the manuscript the first time and asked for all these things that were already in it. The second review, he still didn't read the manuscript. He asked for materials and methods which were stated in the manuscript to be found in a supplemental document provided. Um, you know, the, it's funny because the paper was so long, the editor actually asked us to uh, put the supplemental material, uh, the materials and methods in a supplemental document um, because it was so long. And so we did that, and then he says we don't have it, even though in the actual manuscript there, and you can go read it for yourself, we say look to supplement whatever to find the materials and methods. He also kept saying that the samples were contaminated and or degraded, which means de uh, that they were uh, basically had decomposed, which, you know, I can address that in another video. We actually have a um, uh, a figure in the paper uh, showing gels that uh, would, if, the, if it was degraded, there would be a smearing 
of the DNA instead of a nice neat band and uh, so we provided those already in the paper that the DNA was not degraded and he kept calling the samples ancient DNA and I, we couldn't understand this because uh, the paper, I mean, the samples were basically fresh, especially the Erickson samples, because they were taken directly from the field and put into a, into uh, a plastic bag and into the freezer. So they were extremely fresh. And the hair, um, they, the hair follicles, if they had been degraded, they wouldn't have, have tested. And they would have also showed up as being very smeared on, on our yield gels. So... Um, that picture's already in the, the paper. You can go look and see. Um, Rivera f f 3, remember, he was the one that made fun of us and was so unprofessional. This time he just said that it must be a mixture of animal and human DNA and, it, you know, had to be contaminated, and he just, you know, didn't believe it. And that's exactly, you know, what he said. Once again, at the bottom of the page in red, you can see the actual um, place where these all of these reviews are, and you can go read them yourself. Um, reviewer 4, <laughs> he refused to review it at all a second time. So we're down to two reviewers that make the decision. One didn't read it, and the other one made fun of it and said he didn't believe it. It was just had to be a had to be contamination. Did they ask for any proof that we could show that it wasn't contaminated? No, they didn't. They just you know, blew it off out of hand. Um, so, if this isn't professional bias, I don't know. But at the end of this video, uh, I'll show you the ultimate bias. It's laughable. Okay, a little bit of science. And I know that some of you are going to have a little trouble understanding this, but um, I'll try to make it as easy as possible. Uh, there's two different types of DNA testing that we used uh, in order to determine whether or not um, there was contamination in the samples. Um, since there was no contamination, I'm just using some stock slides I had to, uh, to show this. Um, on the left, you have what's called um, STRs, and these are lengths of DNA that are inherited. Uh, they're not in the genes, they're not uh, per se, and they're not um, in a coding region or anything of the DNA. They're just um, little repeat sequences that um, happen whenever... Um, when two parents have a child, the child is going to have a combination of those length sequences. It's inherited. It's used for paternity testing, for forensic profiling. Uh, it's got a, you know several different uses. And I have a very simple, uh, this is actually a horse uh, set of electropherograms, um, which is what you call these, um, these graphic representations of the DNA. And there's several different markers here. Uh, there's actually, um, you know, a space between them, so you can tell where they are. There's either one or two different peaks to each of the loci or place where the DNA is. Loci is just like um, the location on the chromosome where you find it. Um, so I gave an example um, on this of... If you have an individual, and they have names they give to these, but we're talking raw data here, so we're just doing it in numbers of base pairs. Uh, and a base pair is um, the two nucleic acids that make up each um, point of the sequence and the length of the sequence. So you have 168 base pairs over 184 base pairs on on one of the, on one of these loci, and um, you can actually look and it will be, um, uh, let's see, I don't believe we have actually that one. This was just an example I made up. Um, 184 repeated bases from one parent and 168 repeated bases from another parent at the same spot in the DNA. Uh, therefore, it's called a short tandem repeat. Uh, these are actually dinucleotides, uh, meaning that there's two bases for each repeat. So like, for instance, your DNA sequence on a on a length of repeated DNA is like CA, 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 as the example below. Um, so these, like I say, these lengths are inherited. So where you have, you know, one single peak, it's like both parents gave the single peak or the one same size 
uh, length of DNA to the offspring, like in the top, the the real tall blue uh, peak to the far left is called is basically a homozygous uh, peak. It means that um, it looks like it's about an 89 over 89, which means that this horse inherited an 89 length at that locus uh, or that position on the DNA uh, from both its parents. Uh, if you come over to the there's a a second single peak and then there's a double peak uh, the double peak there uh, would what the parent would give uh, one peak of one length of DNA to it and the other parent would give the second one so it's called heterozygous uh, probably an easier example to see is um, on the green uh, there's a single peak and then there's uh, two peaks that you see there uh, those two peaks um, are once again heterozygote got different length of DNA fragments from each of the parents so it's called a length polymorphism or a change in length of the DNA repeat and repeat is once again just the same um, nucleic acids repeated over and over like CA, 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 CA. Um, the second type of DNA we're looking at is, is what we call SNPs, which are uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, they have to do with variations in DNA sequence from one individual to the next. There are little mutations, single base mutations. And once again, you got an example here. You'll see that uh, in the up where the era is, the upper electropherogram has, or chromatogram as, as some people call them, um, has two red peaks. And you look down um, to the bottom um, at the same place, and you got a red peak and a, and a blue peak. Uh, so the second peak there, um, one of them has a, a thymine, and uh, the other one has. Uh, cytosine which means that they are different at that particular locus and therefore it is a sequence polymorphism there's a single nucleotide that's different from the top individual to the bottom individual so um, that that's an example of when you're sequencing you can see the difference between individuals We'll talk about sequencing first. Um, you know, the peer reviewer asked, you know, wanted us to use universal mammalian primers. And if you wonder what they are, they're short sequences or pieces of synthetic DNA that are synthesized, um, they're artificially made. And they're made to attach by enzymes called polymerases in the polymerase chain reaction. They target DNA in order to select particular sequence that you want to replicate when you use the polymerase chain reaction in your amplification of DNA. Because you have to amplify DNA in order to attain enough, enough of the DNA material uh, that you can visually see it when you put it in the machine in the sequencer. So I uh, have a little graphic representation there. I'm sure it won't mean a lot to some of you, but um, it's, it shows how the primers will attach to a specific spot on your, DNA seek, on your DNA, and it will cause that particular place uh, in your genome to be amplified to make enough copies so that the sequencer will, will show it. Um, Universal primers simply mean that they work in many species, in this case mammals, and um, we and there's several published papers on different, there's cytochrome B and there's um, ones that, uh, well they're called, they're in the, the uh, I guess the common name that you find if you go to, to query them is uh, DHL and THR is the name of the two primers. And they're in hypervariable region one um, of the mitochondrial DNA. Now, both of these types of universal primers, we use both types. Um, they will, when you take the sequence that they generate at the end um, and you blast it against GenBank, which is the international depository for DNA sequences, there's just millions and millions of them in there. 
uh, it'll tell you what sequence, what uh, species you have uh, using the mitochondrial DNA. And um, this is how species determination is done uh, when you have like a forensic case where there's animals involved. We had a kind of an interesting case where um, some dogs had killed uh, some horses and uh, they swabbed the horses for the dog's saliva and then they uh, impounded the dogs and collected their feces and uh, we ended up testing those samples to determine which dogs were guilty uh, leaving their saliva on the victims as well as uh, passing equine DNA in their stool and, the, and which ones were negative for this. Um, there were like six different defendants in this case uh, whose dogs were blamed for this and I think if I remember correctly four of them were guilty. Um, anyway, um, the universal primers are synthesized with the idea that you know, certain parts of your DNA are shared among a lot of species. And so if you put your primer in the region where it's shared between many species, then um, the DNA that's in between those areas will be amplified and you can, you know, tell what species you have. Um, anyway, um, all of these tests are, are just standard tests. They're in the literature. We didn't do anything special. Um, in order to to do these uh, these tests, um, they're easy to show contamination uh, with the using these tests because um, generally when you when you manually sequence, you're gonna at least when you're doing it for forensics, you do it what's called a yield gel, and you you put the amplified DNA from these universal mammalian primers onto your yield gel. And um, you've seen pictures, I'm sure, on TV where they put, um, they have all these little holes and they're putting the colored liquid into the little holes. And then they migrate forward uh, and they form these bands that are so popular on these forensic shows. And these bands of DNA um, show, A, that your amplification worked well. And B, when you're using universal mammalian primers, a lot of the species have different size fragments, so you can uh, see if there's more than one species in your sample. Here's an example. Now, I had to make this example because um, we didn't have any um, contaminated samples in the study. Um, we um, had... Um, in this slide particularly, I used uh, dog DNA and I mixed it with human DNA. Um, this is using uh, universal mammalian primers. Um, we had a human positive control and then we showed a negative control there. There were actually two of them, but I, I sliced it up so I'd have room to put uh, the mixed samples. Um, there were th three human samples and then there were a bunch, uh, seven dog samples that we ran on this yield gel and then I mixed human and dog and put a, a human between them and then human and dog again. As you can see the dog sample band is a different size than the human so you've got two bands showing up and this would indicate a contaminated sample. Uh, you can actually see more than one band present and that shouldn't be. If you have a clean sample, you're only going to get the single bands. Uh, they may be at a different size and show and, and not be at, a, at the same level when you're using these mitochondrial primers, but um, you will see a single band unless you have a mixed mammalian sample. Well, obviously Sasquatch has hair, so that would put it, make it a mammal. So these are, these are a good, uh, good type of, of test to use. Um, because most likely, if there had been, you know, like a dog or a bear or something in the sample, it would have shown up different than the human that we got the results from. Okay, now here's an actual yield gel from the study. Um, we use, This was using the uh, hypervariable region 1 primers, THR and DHL, which are universal mammalian primers and we use these commonly for species identification uh, in forensic cases. Um, you can see the little light bands at the bottom. Those are just leftover primer bands. Uh, you see those in these gels. They're just artifact and not to be worried about. Uh, 
and then and they'll be a little brighter whenever they're not used up in the DNA and you can see that with your negative controls. Um, the first lane shows a, a, a extraction blank, a negative control. This was the extraction liquid with nothing done to it and um, there's no band. And then you see the three Erickson samples, 37, 29, 31. Um, 31 had the whole genome done and you can see that uh, nice clean bands there's no other bands around them. There's no uh, no contamination there. Strictly human. And this is in mitochondrial DNA now. And then you have an amplification blank, which means that this was these were this was our amplification mixture. Um, the liquids we use with the enzymes and everything to uh, perform the polymerase chain reaction where you amplify the DNA. And if there had been any DNA contaminating any of those uh, reagents or if we had handled the samples inappropriately, there would have been a band, uh, a band present there. And then we have our human control, which obviously is nice and, and bright and on the same level. Um, this shows that there was only one species, and it was human, in the mitochondrial DNA of these Erickson samples. Of course, this was preliminary. This is where we even sequenced. Now, here's the graphic representation after sequencing that the machine puts out. Um, there's four nucleic acids present, and they're each designated by a different color, and that gives you your DNA sequence. You can see the, the abbreviations for them at the top of each of those uh, pictures. Um, Cytosine, adenine, thymine, guanine, the four nucleic acids uh, are abbreviated by the first initial and the order that they're in is what makes you an individual. Um, and so these are two different individuals and in this short little little uh, piece of sequence uh, there's six different uh, polymorphisms or SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, these are mutations where the top individual is different or a different individual than the bottom individual. And the errors point to where you have um, these individual differences in the sequence. Um, now when you have contamination, it would be like one of these was a over, with an overhead projector. In the old days you, would, you could have a clear graphic and you could overlay it on top of another graphic. Well, this is what happens when you have contamination with sequence. Um, if we took this, these particular two and overlaid them, uh, this is, you would have six places in, in the same species in a short little stretch of DNA where you would have
So make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Uh, don't flip off the mountain giant. Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't punt the puck, would you? And for God's sake, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee.